Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our panel on Turkey's election. Which we are not live yet. Hold on. We are not. Okay. One second. Okay. Isn't now live. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning for those who are in uh, the United States right now and joining us. Today, we will discuss the uh, election in Turkey. On the 14th of May, uh, there will be parliamentary and presidential election uh, in Turkey. And uh, it is one of the, uh, probably in the recent histories, one of the most uh, interesting election. There has been so many different uh, issues that impacted the election and the most significantly the uh, earthquake that took place on the February 6th in 11 cities in Turkey significantly affected uh, the process, the campaigns and everything. So we have now two panelists with us, Burhanettin Duran, the general coordinator of SETA Washington and Talha Köse, general coordinator of SETA Brussels. And uh, Burhanettin Duran is the general coordinator of SETA. I'm the... <laughs> Research Director of SETA DC. Apologies for the uh, mistake. And uh, let's start with uh, Professor Duran. Tell us how is the campaign process going and uh, for all blocks, for uh, three different uh, groups of political parties. And how did the earthquake, earthquake affected this process? Thank you, Kuluc. Well, good morning for Washington and good afternoon for uh, Turkey for Ankara. Um, well, uh, as you said, as you mentioned, uh, this elections, these elections actually are the historical elections. Uh, it is already mentioned in the uh, international media that uh, this is the Turkey's elections is the uh, most critical elections of 2023. But for Turkey, it's a Actually, uh, it seems that the, it's a crossroads because many issues uh, for the next century of the Turkish Republic uh, would be decided after this, uh, after the results of these elections. May 14 is the date for um, changing many things or continuing uh, with the same policies that are followed by the AK Party. Uh, government and, and President Erdogan. So uh, in Turkey, everybody believes that this is the most important elections in the recent history of Turkey. So um, starting from that point, uh, it's not surprising to tell you that uh, there is so much fierce uh, competition between two candidates, two residential candidates. Certainly one is President Erdogan and, and the other one is the Nations Alliance uh, candidate, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. We are uh, now at the last 10 days and two, two sides are conducting so much ambitious campaign and, uh, and trying to get the support of the uh, undecided waters or let's say silent waters because uh, Turkey is experience, experiencing such a politicized election that I believe that um, the majority, almost uh, all of the uh, electo uh, electorals, they have their uh, preference, but still uh, discussing uh, about all these issues around economic problems, identity issues uh, and security issues, and also, uh, about the uh, PKK and, and FETÖ uh, terrorist organizations' future uh, in Turkey. So um, there is still 10 days, but I believe that um, what will be the impact of the earthquake and or what will be the uh, results of the uh, May 14 in, in the first round, I can say that, yes, the earthquake was... Uh, very effective. And that's why President Erdogan in the last two months uh, focused so much on, on the region and tried to cover uh, the, the problems 
that uh, were the results of the this uh, great earthquake on February 6. But uh, I can say that in the last three and four weeks, we have uh, seen that the public opinion's attention shifted more towards the general macro politics. I mean, the earthquake is still important, but people are now discussing all the problems, all the issues around Turkey's future. And this could be the uh, defense industry, this, this could be foreign policy, this could be security issues, and also, uh, and, and also the, the critical electoral uh, sectors are trying to decide their uh, preference about uh, economic issues uh, in, in the metropolitan areas and also the youth and the women, and these sectors are trying to uh, make their preference. My expectation uh, is that there will be- Professor Duran, we will be, we will be coming the expectations uh, later. Let's okay. get the overview from uh, Talhan. We will also, you mentioned silent voters, and that is one of the biggest challenges of pollsters in many democracies, because we have seen in, multiple different elections in the last decade that those undecided voters, swing voters, silent voters, whatever you call it, they usually become the most significant determinant of these elections, especially elections that is uh, that has a very close call. So uh, we will come back to all those. And uh, Talha, tell us your opinion about the campaign process. How is it going and what is the story here? I think the uh, both sides of the uh, actually from uh, both uh, people's alliance and um, you know, nation alliance they are very close in terms of support and they are very well motivated and as we get closer to the uh, elections the motivation uh, and tension also increases i think uh, it is a difficult process for both sides because uh, they also represent multiple uh, coalitions and you know alliances. So uh, it is on one hand they have to proceed with the existing political campaign uh, for the alliance. On the other hand, the parties have their own motivation to maintain their own uh, you know own campaign. So they have to first of all you know uh, on the one hand and the uh, parliament election. And the second issue and more important issue is the presidential. Uh, presidential. So, but for the first time uh, for maybe two decades, uh, the opposition has been motivated so much. Uh, they feel that, um, you know, they can come par with the uh, President Erdogan and, um, you know, people's uh, alliance. So this is an important factor. You see excitement uh, in all uh, Turkey. This also gives new excitement to supporters of uh, Erdogan. So in the last couple of days, we see that there is consolidation in some of the voters of Erdogan who, feel, who felt a little bit sore. They are returning to their parties, and this also affects the motivation of the you know other alliance so the nation's alliance so i think this uh, as we get closer the uh, the motivation increases the tension increases and uh, also alliances also sometimes make some mistakes uh, but they can easily cover some of the cracks inside uh, you know inside the alliances so one issue is that uh, since is especially for the uh, nation alliance, uh, they haven't worked with together for a long time. So they, it's just an alliance of a year. Uh, all the parties have different discourses. All the uh, parties have these different constituents. So it is very difficult to maintain all all of them together and to maintain a consistent uh, consistent campaign discourse. So one issue here is so they get motivated with some of the um, you know survey results, but um, you know I think for the time being whoever makes uh, less mistakes uh, will be the winner. So they are coming very close to each other, 
uh, it is likely that they are not accustomed to maintain a campaign like this before. So, but, uh, and there are multiple discourses uh, for both sides that are, you know, grand discourses and smaller discourses, but the main discourse is the, you know, the change of the existing government coalition and uh, maintenance of the stability and maintenance of the Turkey's major political orientation, international orientation and economic orientation. I think this is the grand debate uh, for the moment. And both sides are consolidating their, their waters and undecided waters number has been declining uh, day to day. So we'll see if whoever makes the less mistake uh, will be winner in this uh, race, I think. We will talk how we will also come back to the polls because I've been following elections in Turkey probably for the last two decades very closely. Never seen such a poll inflation in the country. Maybe it is the impact of social media. There is not one single day that I see another poll uh, mm -hmm. on social media. I don't, there are companies that has been present for the last three, four decades, of course, but there have been so many different companies and so many different polls that uh, it is it is very difficult not to be confused if you are not knowing the origin of the research and their uh, sampling and everything else. But I I, I see that uh, what you meant it is uh, basically a very competitive race, and we can see in uh, most of those polls. And uh, Professor Duran. Uh, you mentioned the impact of potential impact of different aspects economy. Tell us a little more what are the main issues that can affect voter behavior. So if you uh, put them in uh, in ranking, what would be the first three issues that will affect the voting behavior of Turkish voters next Sunday? Not this Sunday, next Sunday. Okay. Well, um, you know, these uh, times of elections are the times of concerns, fears, hopes, and uh, at the same time, trust. Uh, actually, uh, it is true to say that uh, in these processes of campaigns, which side makes big mistakes uh, could be the loser. But um, because of the competition, this rhetorical uh, polemics have been so much escalated. And I expect that uh, one side of this competition or both sides of the competition could make some mistakes in the last week. Uh, but I expect also that uh, in the last week, uh, there could be a tendency for both sides that uh, we should uh, provide a comprehensive uh, discourse for all the Turkish society that we will give the uh, emotions of trust and hope. Because uh, yes, we think that uh, voters uh, are always rational, but at the same time, emotions are also important in this process. Related to this analysis, I can say that uh, the three issues are very important in the decision making process of or in the in the uh, preference uh, uh, of the waters uh, the first one is the uh, the future of turkey i mean uh, in the next century what would be the the problems of the uh, of, of turkey or what would be the uh, promises what would be the uh, projects of turkey uh, for kılıçdaroğlu or erdogan and these are about um, also security issues. And we are seeing that there is so much focus on the uh, HDP support, uh, Green Left Party, pro, pro PKK uh, Party uh, to Kılıçdaroğlu. This is a great topic that uh, the government is using this against uh, Nations Alliance and Kılıçdaroğlu, uh, Kılıçdaroğlu's candidacy. But at the same time, this, this is a major, well, the first issue, I think. Uh, and the second uh, issue uh, is about uh, who will uh, represent himself as the leader who can manage Turkey's all challenges and problems in the future. I mean, 
you know, uh, Kılıçdaroğlu's uh, perspective is composed of uh, seven uh, deputy presidents. And this uh, present to voters such a diversified and, and dispersed and, and coalition. So this creates somehow a problem of, you know, uh, a problem of image. Uh, uh, Kılıçdaroğlu could be successful in dealing with the problems of Turkey or not. And the third issue is about, of course, economy. Economy uh, in the metropolitan areas is about uh, rents, the increasing uh, rents and, and the uh, housing problems. And in this issue, who can provide the hope that I can do this, I can fix this problem uh, for the near future? And this is the third area that, that I believe that uh, this will have uh, a great impact on the waters. And at the same time, I, uh, I see that, of course, there will be a merge of uh, different emotions. On the one side, uh, criticizing the other side with democracy, uh, with the lack of democracy, or uh, with the lack of capability in dealing with the security issues. But also, there is a very critical dimension to hope. Who can make the great uh, projects for Turkey? great services for Turkey, for the future of Turkey, and who can do it with a very comprehensive way. So I expect that in the last week, both candidates will increase their votes and the other two candidates, Inge and Ogan, uh, will uh, at least uh, Inge will, uh, uh, Inge's uh, voters will change their preferences either to Erdogan or Kılıçdaroğlu. This is the effect that this could be regarded as the effect of first round. And I expect that there will be a very important uh, possibility of second round, but I will not be surprised if the election uh, will be decided on the uh, night of uh, 14 May. I'll have the same question. Uh, what will be the, of course, as uh, Professor Duran said, the future of Turkey is important because this year Turkey celebrates uh, its centenary uh, and of its foundation, Turkish Republic. Uh, because of the earthquake, most of the celebrations are either uh, suspended, postponed or cancelled. But uh, this is an important year and it has been a very prevalent feeling uh, among Turks about the what will be the next century look like for Turkey? It has been uh, on the street, uh, ordinary uh, people and public opinion pays a lot of uh, attention for this feeling. And uh, Talha, tell us, uh, in your opinion, what will be the three most significant issues that will determine the voting behavior this year? Uh, I I think the, before the uh, earthquake, February the 6th uh, earthquake, the major slogan of uh, AK Party's uh, campaign was Turkey's century. So Turkey's century was more forward-looking perspective that tried to integrate Turkey into a new uh, industrial, post-industrial age uh, with new uh, industrial capacity, new education, uh, having a more autonomous foreign policy, increasing uh, you know exports uh, increasing the capacity of uh, production and making turkey a, a significant player in international affa affairs and bringing a more stable uh, you know uh, economy under these circumstances as well as uh, providing new opportunities for um, you know the people who are uh, not represented, well represented, uh, and who are disadvantaged groups like the old people, handicapped, uh, and all these people. So there was a new vision uh, which was significant. But after the earthquake, I think rebuilding all these places and re uh, returning to their homes and uh, another risk is, of course, 
um, you know, risk in large cities like Istanbul and other earthquakes. So it suddenly turned out that uh, the earthquake issue and resilience against the natural disasters become an important issue and ag agenda item for uh, Turkey, which was very important. I think um, the, the existing government is well prepared uh, to address those issues, has demonstrated capacity to build uh, infrastructure uh, and you know serve the large cities. Another important issue is the the increasing life costs. So I mean, Turkey Turkey preferred for uh, I mean economic policy that is based on production after the uh, the pandemic. So there was a credit uh, increase, credit boost, uh, and wanted to keep economy working and producing, which increased life costs and also. This credit expansion kept a very dynamic economy, but it increased uh, the inflation. I think controlling the inflation and life costs is second issue that really uh, may be a priority in the coming uh, term. So there is no quick fix to this. And um, whoever is in government will, de will be dealing with this policy, but at least Turkish economy is very dynamic for the moment, adaptive to the international context, and we have a very strong production capacity. The only major issue right now is the there is the income distribution and life cost is increasing. So the, the priority will be in this uh, area. And uh, probably the third issue uh, is to, uh, you know, how to uh, formulate a foreign policy in a zone in a difficult area, uh, you know, on the one hand, we have been experiencing problem in Ukraine uh, and Russia and Ukraine. On the other hand, um, you know, there is, a, you know, a persistent decline in relations with the West. On the other hand, there are new efforts in foreign policy, such as integrating into Turkic world and Africa. So under these circumstances, I think the way Turkey you know, chooses in foreign policy will be very much related to Turkey's economic policies as well as uh, policies. So under these uh, circumstances, I think what the uh, opposition uh, offering is to return to fundamentals of EU integration and NATO and Western or orientation, which I think is not the right fit under these circumstances where the world is moving into multipolar world. AK Party, on the other hand, and the, the the People's Alliance uh, tries to expand autonomy and be, be more adaptive to, uh, you know, changing multipolar world while maintaining good relations with the West. So this is a difficult policy. Um, I mean, having a, a, you know, foreign policy that prioritizes not security, but at the same time, economy and uh, medium to, uh, you know, the, the long-term horizon is difficult. Uh, and because the main security and economic relations are very much uh, oriented to West. So maintaining good relations with the West, strengthening the ties with the West, but at the same time, increasing the ties, increasing the relations uh, with the rest is also very important. So this is a challenge. I think that uh, both uh, you know, uh, alliances have different perspective on this. Uh, for the economic policy, I think they have differences in terms of uh, conventional uh, economic policy uh, versus uh, the, the current uh, policy. And, but the most important issue for the moment that most, most people in Turkey is concerned is related to disaster preparedness and rebuilding the cities and getting you know, resilient to possible uh, another uh, disaster around the Western part of Turkey. Thank you, Talhant. As you mentioned, uh, Turkey is in an active uh, seismic zone. There is more than 15,000 kilometers of active, uh, active uh, zones, fault lines in Turkey, actually. Uh, as a result of that, uh, the earthquake, of course, uh, immediate impact of the earthquake has been to the region, to 11 cities, but it also generated uh, more awareness, more attention uh, to people in different parts of the country, especially those in Istanbul, which some seismologists expect uh, to have an earthquake uh, in the next couple of decades. 
So it is. It will be especially uh, the preparation for the earthquake and the uh, reconstruction efforts in the uh, 11 cities that are directly impacted by the earthquake would be an important agenda item for the voters. And of course, the foreign policy, we do not expect in many countries, in many democracies to have foreign policy in one of the top three uh, issues that affect the voting behavior. But uh, Turkey as being very a uh, foreign policy attentive public, having a very uh, attentive public on foreign policy issues, partly because of the geography that uh, Turkey has been and the conflicts around it, probably foreign policy and foreign policy visions of the, the different candidates, different blocks will play an important role. Now let's turn to Pro, uh, Professor Duran again and tell us what the uh, polls say about the elections, both the presidential and parliamentary. And let's come back now to the silent voters. And uh, most of the uh, credible uh, pollsters right now arguing that uh, the most important voting bloc will be undecided or silent voters. And some of them even stated that they will decide those, according to some, it is between 7 to 10 percent we are talking about. According to them, they will decide their votes on the election day. And some of them, even while they are voting, who are these voters and why they are undecided? Yeah, uh, thank you, Kulich. Uh, very important question, actually. Um, well, before uh, telling my uh, expectation, I should mention this um, important reality in, in, in the current Turkish politics. Since there is so much competition of campaigns, red escalation of rhetorics, and a critical the feeling of a critical election, uh, we see that some people are in a way hiding their preference. That doesn't mean that they haven't decided yet. But still at the same time, uh, all the issues from identity issues to security, economy, and leadership issues, there are so complex and interdependent subjects that each day um, political leaders, candidates, parties are touching upon and forcing the voters to, to their side. So this is a, a war of propaganda. This is a, like a war of, a, a big war of uh, campaigns. And at the same time, for, for the polls, I can tell the same thing. There was such a uh, war of polls until now, uh, supporting uh, one candidate for another. Uh, now I can say that uh, they are coming to a reasonable level and both of both sides polls are telling us that, you know, we, have, we are ahead of one or two percent. Um, this is understandable. And, and, and I expect that the la in the last week, undecided waters or flotile waters or silent waters or, or the waters of Inje and Ogan who are very uh, prone to uh, nationalistic and, and some, some kind of um, you know, nationalistic feelings they will make the decision. I mean, they will uh, shape the result uh, at uh, May 14 night. So um, I don't think that they are uh, undecided, but they are silent. Mostly they are silent. For Inje and Ogans voters, I can say that they are so much ideological and they will choose on the basis of uh, which side is more energetic, more uh, willing to fight with terrorism and to pay something to uh, nationalistic issues. And uh, these waters are not undecided. They, are, they have something to uh, tell, but at the same time, they know that their uh, candidates will not win. So if they uh, prefer to vote for their for Inge and Ogan and to make this election as the second round, and we will see the second round. And then 
uh, what will dominate the agenda. Uh, I expect that this uh, PKK and FETÖ support to Kustarogu is the most critical issue for voters. Yes, economy is important, but at the end of the day, your country or, or your feelings of security or uh, economic expectations and, and the current problems. This time, uh, undecided silent voters will make their decisions on the basis of the uh, dichotomy that, that was created by the two candidates in the last resort. Uh, well, uh, they will, uh, these voters are mostly, I think, mostly uh, people are living in the metropolitan areas and they are mostly uh, from uh, right wing uh, electors, voters, uh, and they are very pragmatic. And some of them are just watching who will win. At the end of the day, uh, some percent of the votes, undecided voters, silent voters, are trying to feel which side is gonna win. So they will make the last preference in the uh, voting boxes uh, at, at, the, at the day of 14 May, uh, which side? So uh, that's it. Uh, Talha, tell us your opinion about the polls. And of course, it is both presidential and parliamentary elections. So uh, the, uh, in addition to, uh, we mostly focus on presidential election and most of the debate in Turkey has been going on on presidential election, but to have the parliamentary majority is a significant issue as well. And there, because of that, there have been maybe not uh, out there, but uh, at the uh, street uh, on the uh, ground, actually, there has been very fierce competition between political parties. I, I'm in Istanbul right now, and I have been following the campaigns of the parties over here and from the neighborhoods, from the districts, all of the organizational uh, body of the parties are working diligently to get more voters, to get the majority in the parliament as well. I think we will have an extremely diverse parliament. So we will see new actors, for instance, the Turkey Ishi Party, the Workers' Party, Hudapar, Yeniden Refah, Büyük Birlik Partisi. So new smaller parties, Deva Gelecek, so they have all, all their candidates. So for the time being, they are part of the alliances and also Zafer Partisi, Memlek, Memleket Partisi. So most likely, especially the alliances will not have the problem of the 7% threshold, which means that we will have alliances, but at the same time, we will have many parties that will be represented in the parliament. So in the coming years, if there are some major disagreements among the leaders, so these uh, candidates, these I mean, these uh, MPs may have their own, you know, uh, you know, uh, engagement. We uh, may go one party to other, or uh, they, there may be some cross-cutting and overlapping interests in the parliament. So I think parliament will be very important, and uh, of course the the current system, the Hunt system, will work better for the uh, bigger parties like AK Party and JHP, so they will be more represented. However, there will be members uh, from other smaller parties whose vote may be critical in the coming. So their discourses may be uh, heard more in the parliament. So I think there will be a very colorful parliament uh, in, the, you know, in the, uh, this election. Uh, if we come to the presidential, I think uh, we get uh, you know, different uh, research companies, post companies, they you know, report extremely diverse results, uh, especially in the last two months. But as we get closer to the elections, I think the numbers get closer to each other. So actually, it is almost at the zone of, uh, you know, close, very close to each other. So I think the real numbers will be reflected um, next weeks and probably, you know, the next couple of days. Uh, we will have a better picture. So after, uh, I think, after um, today or tomorrow, we will not hear any more uh, the, um, uh, the re results. But uh, what I expect here is that I think there are uh, three or four types of uh, people whose uh, you know 
preferences whose votes are not reflected uh, in those uh, polls. So first of all, the first time voters who live with their families, I think uh, most of them, uh, you know, don't give, you know, a proper answer or their uh, opinions are not well represented in the polls. Secondly, the people from the earthquake zone, so most of them uh, are, I mean, moved to other cities. So we don't know how their preferences will be reflected. Third issue is the Turks outside of Turkey. So the other, I mean, uh, I think we see uh, there's huge interest in voting of these uh, and we don't see the results uh, properly in the polls. And the fourth one is the security personnel like the police and military. So their preferences are not necessarily reflected. So I think to get the holistic picture, we have to also integrate with these four types of uh, voters. Uh, and I think uh, outcome may be uh, very unexpected. So I think if we include, incorporate all these actors to the uh, real elections, I think uh, the election results may be one or two percent uh, in, uh, I mean, unexpected results can be seen. So I expect that the Turks outside of the Turkey and security personnel will be uh, predominantly voting, but uh, a people's uh, alliance. Uh, we don't exactly know what will happen with the earthquake. I think the people who cannot uh, votes because of moving. And for the younger population, we still don't have uh, a clear picture. So uh, many pollsters argue that they will be voting for change. But, you know, I think the, the picture is not that clear for uh, those uh, voters. So they may not be as, uh, you know, pro change, I mean, change meaning that they are expected to vote for the uh, you know, uh, nations alliance, but there are certain issues, that certain uh, contradictions that may deter them to vote for the nations alliance, because we see that all the fault lines, all the uh, cleavages that exist in Turkey are also reflected in nations alliance, so the opposition alliance. So I think we have to take into consideration so that the Turkish and Kurdish nationalists, Islamists and liberals so, uh, you know, Alevi, Sunni, all these cleavages are represented. And also, uh, you know, people from different social economic backgrounds. So, you know, higher, uh, you know, higher, you know, uh, more uh, higher class uh, neighborhoods, uh, richer neighborhoods plus the lower uh, neighborhood. So I think there are too many cleavages existing in uh, Nations Alliance. So although it is portrayed that, they, that the young generation will be voting for them, I think they still have clear questions as, as they go to voting uh, poll stations. I think uh, the results may be different. So, but still, I think the four types of voters are not clearly defined and their perspective will probably be de de uh, determine the outcomes of the elections. Thank you very much, Talha. And correct me if I'm wrong, there's more than 6 million first time voters. So that... uh, 5 million plus. So I don't know exactly, but plus, close to, yeah. So yeah. it is almost 10% of all voting block if we are talking about something um, a little more than 60 million eligible voters in Turkey. So it is 10%, it is a significant number. And earthquake zone, as we said, impacted 11 uh, cities, more than 15 mm -hmm. million people. I'm not sure about how many people uh, left their cities or registered to vote in different cities and how many are planning to come back to their cities to vote because I know that political parties launch a, a mobilization effort to uh, carry the majority of them are not registered in yeah. different cities so as the, so you know it is a big number and uh, the uh, political parties are mobilized to uh, find a way to carry them actually uh, transfer them uh, provide a transfer for them to go to their cities and then come back uh, to uh, where they stay 
And in Turks in diaspora, I guess uh, the first uh, couple of days, the numbers show that it has been record number of participation. Uh, and in uh, many countries that Turkish, popula uh, Turkish population is high, including Germany, I have seen that at least 40% increase in the voting in the first five days. And these will probably be reflected itself uh, in, the, uh, in, in the election results. And these are the things actually that uh, when I have conversation with the pollsters, the most difficult issues that they are trying to figure out. It's very hard to understand the diaspora voters because it is very difficult to pre uh, present a systematic polling uh, to figure out their voting behavior. And the first time voters, they can change their mind very quickly, as we have seen in Muharram Inje uh, phenomena, let's say, right? Uh, in the when he, he it was the surprise candidate actually uh, a month ago when he started his campaign, his votes. Some pollsters showed that his votes was around thirteen percent, and uh, at least half of them was first time voters. Of course, since then we have seen that uh, there is an erosion in his support base, but we are not sure who will these first time voters vote. So, and of course the earthquake uh, zone posters are having significant issues to predict their voting behavior as well. Uh, Professor Duran, let's go back now to uh, foreign policy. I think this is, uh, since this is Washington DC event, uh, probably uh, our viewers are curious about the foreign policy vision of two presidential candidates. What will be different if uh, President Erdogan wins again? Do you expect any different or do you think there will be consistency in foreign policy? And what is the uh, what do you expect from Kılıçdaroğlu and what did they offer so, uh, so far in regards to foreign policy? Yeah. Well, Kılıç, um, if President Erdogan continues his government, um, less and more, um, the foreign policy uh, issues would be in the continuation aspect. I mean, there will be uh, much more efforts to uh, further this normalization process in the Middle East, including Egypt and, and Syria. And also, um, there, there will be some attempts to normalize bilateral relations with Greece, uh, EU, and, and the, of course, the US. But at the same time, um, President Erdogan announced uh, his foreign policy uh, aim of uh, you know, supporting, strengthening the axis of Turkey. And this policy perspective, foreign policy perspective is an integrated policy, um, meaning that uh, giving support to some uh, defense industry and security issues and diplomacy at the same time. And also regarding the Ukrainian war, the war in Ukraine, uh, Erdogan's uh, diplomacy of bringing two sides together and, and following a policy of balance between uh, the US, Europe and, and Russia will continue. And this means that uh, Erdogan's foreign policy uh, will have a, a new uh, five, a period of five years for consolidating uh, the general uh, framework of the earlier foreign policy. But uh, for Kılıçdaroğlu, there is an ambiguity. Actually, um, the, the parties are, that supporting Kılıçdaroğlu are so much um, you know, diverse, diversified, and their foreign policy issues perspectives are somehow conflictual at the same time. For example, regarding Syrian refugees, Kılıçdaroğlu is telling that we will uh, send them back, but this uh, is conflictual with his idea of we will restore relations with the US and uh, uh, EU because this uh, refugee issue is so much um, you know, polarized and some uh, nationalist uh, people are telling that, and even uh, Ogan is, is on the same page, that we will send them back. 
So how could it be possible uh, with your relations uh, uh, with a strong rapprochement with Syria, send, send them back, send Syrians back, and at the same time, have a good relations with the EU. Uh, these are very problematic. And at the same time, um, with Greece, yeah, there is there are some nationalistic feelings and regarding uh, the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean, uh, how can you manage uh, a much more uh, rapprochement uh, without the challenge of uh, Greece maximalist, maximalist policies in those areas? So these, these are creating somehow ambiguity for Kılıçdaroğlu. And it's also the same with uh, HTP, pro-PKK parties, uh, radical, uh, you know, uh, radical concerns, uh, radical ambitions. I mean, they are for, um, uh, they are for somehow autonomy in, in Turkey and they want the release of PKK militants, uh, Demirtas and Öcalan at the same time. So uh, and at the same time, they demand that Turkish military forces should withdraw from Iraq and Syria. Um, how could it be possible with the, the uh, with struggling the PKK uh, terrorism, but at the same time withdrawing your military forces from uh, Syria and Iraq? So you know th there is a difficulty of combining all these different parties foreign policy perspectives together. Even Davutoglu, once AK Party's prime minister, who was the uh, behind the Syria policy of AK Party is now supporting Kılıçdaroğlu. And Kılıçdaroğlu is criticizing uh, Ahmet Davutoğlu's foreign policy of Syria while he was prime minister. So these are very conflictual and, uh, and this creates some concerns about uh, security issues, PKK issues, and uh, the possible um, scenario of a PKK a terror corridor or statelet uh, in, in Syria and uh, even in Iraq, uh, they can find some opportunity even for making terrorism uh, in Turkey. So these are the very concerns of um, people and we are talking so much about this. And something is very interesting, Kılıç, you know, um, Kandil, PKK uh, leaders are supporting openly Kılıçdaroğlu. Yes, HTP is, is supporting, but uh, PKK uh, leaders are much more uh, vigorous, much more outspoken in their support to uh, Kılıçdaroğlu. And uh, I, I think that this, this is the reality that if PKK supports Kılıçdaroğlu, this is against Kılıçdaroğlu, but still PKK leaders are doing this. This also creating great concerns for Turkish public opinion because uh, PKK is considering that there is an opportunity, there's a fertile ground for making some ideological and political uh, uh, gains in supporting Kılıçdaroğlu even in the election times. So this is the most important dominant issue of, of uh, this uh, May 14 elections. And I will I, uh, I expect that this will continue to dominate the main agenda. Talha, the same question. I think uh, for the uh, opposition's nations alliance, foreign policy area is like mind zone. So they have parties from you know all uh, ideological orientations. So Islamist parties, pro-Western parties, nationalist parties, plus the party uh, that supports them uh, in the presidential elections, Kurdish nationalists. So on the one hand, uh, probably Gelecek and Saadet wants to improve ties with the Muslim countries. On the other hand, um, you know, uh, Republican People's Party want to reorient foreign policy towards EU and NATO. Uh, the other issue for, um, you know, uh, E-Party, they would probably prioritize security, whereas, uh, you know, HTP will prioritize 
uh, more liberty, autonomy, and uh, sustaining of the cross-border operations. So I think in almost e all areas, there will be some contestation and disagreements. So uh, we can see that you know, this, the security is issue will not be prioritized in uh, Nations Alliance. Uh, whereas in, uh, if uh, President Erdogan wins again, I think uh, security will be priority. I think there will be a clear orientation to continue fighting against terrorism. Uh, there will be stronger ties with Muslim countries, with Turkic countries. Uh, and I expect some form of gradual uh, normalization with EU and probably US. And more importantly, normalization process with Egypt, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates will be another priority, which will increase Turkey's um, autonomy in terms of its orientation. And so Africa will also be prioritized. So we will see that continuation of the current uh, foreign policy, plus maybe a new opening with EU and new opening with uh, the countries that normalization uh, process started if uh, President Erdogan is elected. Whereas there will be some disagreements, some major issues uh, in uh, you know, Nations Alliance. Uh, one thing that Europeans expect is that they will ex they expect that Kılıçdaroğlu will be in more line with Ukraine in the case of Russia, rather than uh, pursuing a more balanced approach. They expect that Turkey should take uh, a more pro-Ukrainian line rather than losing the balance. This will actually diminish Turkey's position as a mediator. Another issue, probably Turkey will be more soft on uh, Sweden's uh, membership to NATO, and probably uh, there will be. Uh, you know, uh, stronger initiatives for normalizing relations with the EU. Whereas I don't see any appetite from the EU, to be honest, from the Brussels, they don't expect uh, opening new chapters for negotiations with Turkey, even if uh, Kılıçdaroğlu wins. So I think there may be some further Western orientations, but we will not see significant appetite from the Western, uh, you know, actors. Uh, and probably security will not be the priority if you know there is a nation's uh, alliance, and there will be some major disagreements. I expect uh, uh, major problems among the leaders uh, if you know there is a change. Uh, but I think uh, for the foreign policy, I think Turkey will be one of the security providing uh, actors with the new capacity investment in security as well as uh, military technology. So I think Turkey will try to expand and limit the dependency in energy and uh, military. And this may uh, actually give new roles uh, for Turkey in regional issues, regional uh, conflicts. But I'm more optimistic in terms of finding solutions to existing tensions because uh, many of these tensions are on hold. So maybe in the Syria issue, Greece issue, Egypt issue, they or even with the US, they keep it on, on hold and see. And even if uh, Erdogan is elected, I think there may be some major uh, positive changes in all these areas. Thank you very much. And I know we have seven minutes left. I received multiple questions, one from the chat box, uh, the Q&A Q &A box here, others from social media. But while talking about foreign policy, one of the most significant foreign policy agenda items for Turkey has been relations with the United States. And uh, Professor Duran, tell us what you expect uh, the relations of the United, the relations between Turkey and United States after the elections. Well, um... Somehow it depends who wins. Uh, that's why I should answer your question uh, by two scenarios. If President Erdogan wins the election, and then uh, we can expect that uh, the same uh, policy of uh, balanced approach to the war in Ukraine will continue. And this means that Turkey um, will try to restore bilateral relations with the US while expecting some uh, positive responses regarding F-16 and, and some other uh, areas of cooperation. Um, actually, I see some spaces like Africa and, and 
uh, and in Central Asia, uh, and even the Middle East, uh, the new configuration of the Middle East could be areas for cooperation between Turkey and the US. But still, I, we should be realistic that the Syria issue, the YPG issue and FETO issue are the, the, the hot topics that should be uh, taken with uh, between uh, brackets while trying to have a positive uh, momentum by uh, initiating the death strategic mechanism. Well, uh, we, as, as the world, we are uh, passing through a difficult time. I mean, the great power rivalry has been intensified and the, we see that China is in the Middle East and China is uh, diplomatically trying to have uh, its influence on, on the, in the Middle East. And if this continues, uh, I, I, I just I refer to uh, the rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia by the mediation of China. If this continues in the Middle East and in other parts of the world, that means China is uh, becoming more and more relevant uh, at diplomacy as well. So this is an aspect that uh, Turkey would find itself in a, again, uh, in, a, in a positive way, uh, uh, influencing this uh, issues in, at different uh, regions. And I see there could be some um, areas of cooperation between Turkey and the US uh, at such. So, well, but at the same time, it depends on the US approach to Turkey, because you know better than me, um, Washington uh, is not trying to have a new momentum uh, in repairing uh, Turkish-American relations uh, by somehow changing some perceptions. And this will create uh, some tensions if that continues, this will create, uh, uh, that will continue to create uh, tensions between Turkey and the US. If Kılıçdaroğlu wins, uh, then this ambiguity and, 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 and this undecided position uh, will decrease Turkey's capacity in terms of defense, energy, and, and diplomacy levels. And this can create uh, some problems even with Greece and, and other neighbor countries. And because Turkey uh, here is providing security and stability in the region and uh, somehow uh, balancing sometimes Russia and sometimes some other powers. And this um, uh, ambiguity uh, and uh, this let's say a pacifistic uh, approach uh, will create some other problems that that we don't want to hear we don't want to see uh, here in our region that's why i see that some western capitals are just watching who will win in turkey and what will be the impact of this elections uh, in their side uh, kılıçdaroğlu is, if kılıçdaroğlu wins uh, everything will not be positive, will not be okay for themselves because uh, Turkey's instability, Turkey's uh, decrease in Turkey's capacity uh, will create other problems in the region as well. So um, it is uh, this, this perspective that I consider the Turkish-US relations after the elections. Alha, I will more specify this question to very significant issues that has been impacted by lateral relations as 400 issue and YPG issue. What would you expect for the future, uh, for the trajectory of Turkish American relations in these two different issues after the elections? I think the YPG issue is the most significant issue that poisons Turkish American relations. And I don't see any meaningful change if uh, United States continues to support this organization clearly, openly, or closely. So I think this is the fundamental issue. And if uh, Erdogan and uh, you know, uh, People's Alliance is in power, I think this will be taken as 
a significant issue that is related to survival of the Turkish state. So I think this will be very important. For the S-400 issue, this is more related to balance between Tur Turkey and, you know, between Russia and US. So I think this is not a fundamental national security issue. This is open to negotiation. So Turkey may prefer a more balanced approach between Russia and United States if there is such a potential. And in the coming years, maybe two, three years, Turkey may um, you know, have its own capacity for long range, um, but, you know, long range missile defense system. But I think um, you know, this is also related to the orientation of the uh, administration in the United States. I think Washington's perspective is also very important. For the time being, uh, Democrats are considered as uh, more ideologically oriented foreign policy, which sidelines Erdogan and his uh, you know, foreign policy perspective. I think if there is a more pragmatic perspective, there are really uh, opportunities and lines of cooperation but I think the you know the the, the red line uh, in Turkish American relation is not the S four hundred or Gulen, but uh, YPG issue. So if this orientation and policy preference continues, and if uh, Santcom continues to demonstrate their strong support with uh, YPG affiliated actors, I don't expect any uh, constructive change, perspective change from Turkish security uh, apparatus and even uh, for the... Uh, so I think there may be a lot of pragmatic zones, practical zones of cooperation, but uh, the trust will not be restored in this area. I don't know the perspective of Washington in terms of restoring the trust, but I think um, you know they may probably have their own red lines, but from, from the Turkish perspective, from the Ankara's perspective, I think YPG is the red line. And there are many other areas of practical cooperation if uh, Washington decides to prefer practical, more pragmatic foreign policy towards Turkey. Thank you. And I know we have just one minute left, but I will give you 30 seconds or more for each panelist for questions in regards to election security. So uh, there are some questions about the security in the election process. And uh, should we, there is a question about, should we be concerned about the election night in Turkey? Well, so, yeah, Kılıç, you know, uh, in the presidential systems, uh, the election campaigns are full of noise, uh, rising uh, rhetorics, polemics, and and somehow accusations uh, of each other. Uh, it is the same with Turkey now, but I believe that um, Turkey is a consolidated democracy in terms of providing this election security for decades. So in, uh, both parties will respect and do what is needed, what is uh, obliged to do uh, if they win or uh, lose. So I don't expect that these are concerns over Turkey's post-election times in the in the media uh, are are somehow uh, overrated. I mean, uh, overestimated issues, and I I don't expect that there could be any serious uh, uh, issue of instability for Turkish democracy uh, uh, at 14 May night. I'll have the same question. I think the election security in Turkey is very strong. There is no documented uh, voters fraud in Turkish history that would change the election results. So I think we, I mean, the, the procedure is very transparent and it can be easily, uh, you know, uh, I mean, seen, uh, you know, both uh, parties. I think some members from both sides may mentioned in order to, I mean, if they lose the elections, this may, this is used in a, as an argument, but in no election we have seen such a documented fraud or such a systematic, you know, uh, change and manipulation in the results. So I'm optimistic again about this process, but both sides should also keep their, you know, audience supporters clear on this issue. I mean, let's trust the, you know, the election procedure and process and let's keep it. I mean, uh, the tension will not work for you know the, all these rumors that are you know uh, uh, rotated in social media are baseless. I think. 
Thank you very much for our two panelists and thanks for everyone who joined us on Zoom and watched us on our Twitter and YouTube accounts. We will continue to have these discussions on election. We will have another panel on Monday on elections and another one just before the elections on Friday. But, uh, that will be organized by SETA DC. And immediately after the election on Monday, we will have another panel evaluating and assessing the results of the election. So hope to see you again uh, in these panels. And I want to thank for our panelists again and see you again. Have a good day. Thank you, Rich.